problem is to get um, from S to G as if we were a cab driver. So first we'll start out by uh, checking out uh, what um, a New York cab driver would do. <laughs> nice route. <laughs> But uh, we might hope for a Boston cab driver. Nice people all. Pretty good. Note the, note the route, so you can compare it against the next one. Right up along that upper edge. Gets blocked there for some reason. Probably construction. <laughs> and comes of down right around in here to G. Oh, let's try, um, that's a uh, cab driver's a unemployable physics major after the third postdoc. <laughs> Does a lot of thinking. <laughs> it finds a terrific route. In fact, it's the best possible route. So uh, understanding all that's one of the, uh, one thing that uh, you'll have behind you by the end of the end of the morning. You'll be able to write programs that do that stuff. So there's a map of the United States. And uh, after you become unemployable computer scientists, maybe you might be set to the task of coloring them. Let's see if we can make a program to color it. Well, we can start with this one. That was instantaneous, but not a very good map because a lot of the states with common boundaries share colors. So we could try some simple-minded approach. Here's a simple-minded approach. Keeps trying stuff and trying stuff and runs into dead ends and backs up and tries some other stuff. I um, don't know how long this uh, program will run before it finds a suitable coloring of the map, but my estimate is 10 to the 10th years uh, as a lower bound. So uh, that's not so hot. On the other hand, uh, we can uh, try another way of doing it. Um, maybe that way. And it finds a perfect, perfectly satisfactory coloring instantaneously. So what's the difference between the futile method that runs for a minimum of 10 to the 10th years and the method I just deployed, which runs instantaneously? You'll understand how this all works by the end of the morning, too. Now you say to me, uh, I didn't blow a year at uh, Ars Digita so that I could uh, drive cabs and color maps. But that's okay because these problems are isomorphic to problems uh, of resource allocation in general. So if you want to allocate airplanes to routes, uh, people to um, assignments, anything that involves a, uh, a uh, scarce resource and lots of work, the stuff that we do today will be the stuff that you need to know. So it's very, very uh, useful kind of AI as a consequence of that. So that's the agenda. Let's get, get to it. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about search, then we're going to talk about constraints, and then we're going to bring the two together. Now, the usual way of talking about search is the way that um, I am going to talk about search. I'm going to talk about uh, finding a way through a map, much like the finding of the way through that uh, little piece of Cambridge. But I'm not going to use Cambridge. It would be all day to do a simulation of that at the blackboard. So we'll do a little simpler map.
There we go. There's a map. I'll put some distances on here. There's S, there's G, we'll give these some labels, A, B, C, D, E, G. So you don't have any trouble figuring out a route through that map and even the best route through that map because you got your eyes and we humans are incredibly good at finding, way, at finding paths through stuff. Uh, so are rats, so don't get a, don't get a, big, don't get a big head. <laughs> Uh, but a program doesn't have vision, and we don't we don't think in terms of this being a vision problem. We think that in terms of this being a a, a problem of organizing up a uh, a uh, organizing up an orderly uh, search uh, through this through this network. Well, how do we do that? You know, what we're going to do is we're going to have a program that doesn't know anything about the map except what it's already seen. So we see a whole thing, but the program only sees what it sees so far. So we're going to use that as a template to construct what the computer would see as it goes. So here we are at, uh, at the beginning, and the computer only knows about S. But the computer says, the program says, uh, the search algorithm says, let's use the right language. Uh, let me see where I can go from here. So it immediately says, I can go from S, I can go to either A or B. And too bad A and B are not G, so we still have some work to do. So from A, we could go to um, B or E. And from B, we could go to A or C. We could also, from A, go back to S, but we're never going to bother biting our own tail on this deal. We're never going to make any loops because we know that's stupid. I mean, there are lots of stupid things we can do in this search, but we don't have to do that one. So there'll be no loops. So let's keep going. Uh, from B, uh, not visiting anything again that we've already been to, we can only go to C. From C, we can only go to D, and there we get stuck. From E, we can go to only G. From A, we can go not back to B, we can only go to E and then to D. Uh, uh, C, D, yeah. From E, we can go to uh, G, I guess. And from C, we can only go to D and get stuck. So actually, what I've actually done is I've drawn out the whole, the whole tree of possible paths through this, through, this, through this map. There aren't any others. I've exhaustively uh, found all the possible paths through this, through this map. Let's call it a graph. We use the grown-up word. I, f I found all the paths through this graph that don't bite their own tail, and that's it. And and the process, the process of finding all the paths, is called the British Museum algorithm. Don't ask me why. I guess it's some sort of slur against either the British or the or museums, or the, in particular the British Museum. But it sort of suggests the kind of plotting, try you know. Try everything until you get it all worked out. And it doesn't matter if it takes 200 years because there'll be British Museum will still be there. Uh, so if we were uh, an algorithm executing British Museum algorithm, we would just develop the whole thing, and then we would look at the bottom and see if, or we look at look at everything, I guess, and see if any of the paths terminate in G. In which case we'd say, ah, I've I've found it. That's one kind of way of searching through the map. Why would it be a bad idea? because it can be expensive. Okay. In fact, some of these searches uh, can be exponential. If you're going to look through a, chess, a tree of chess moves, for example, uh, in the beginning it's essentially exponential. And exponential means bad news. Exponential means 10 to the 10th years and stuff like that. So you'd like to find a, a more organized approach to searching through these graphs. So there are any number of ways of doing it, uh, some better than others, but it always depends on the graph. So I could say to you, let's do a depth first search, and I would say that because it's good for a particular problem, but it might be horrible for the next problem. But these words like depth first search, breadth first search, beam search, A star, these are the vocabulary of artificial intelligence. 
And so to be a practicing computer scientist, you need to know a little bit about this vocabulary so that you're not stunned when somebody says, A star. So that's what we're going to do for the next uh, few decades of minutes. We're going to look at these various search ideas. Not that you're going to memorize them or anything, but I want you to know you know, I want you to know that the, you know I want you to heard the vocabulary and, and see how the vocabulary translates to action. So, from the point of view of representation, the representation is basically these connections. You know, one thing is a neighbor of another. One thing you can do is go from one place to another. That's the representation. That's the constraint. And everything else is a is a variety of algorithms for exploiting that constraint. So it fits into the general picture. Now, uh, depth first search. What's that? Fortunately, these names uh, suggest what you do. A depth first search means that every time you got a choice, you just close your eyes and plunge ahead. And so that we'll have some orderly way of doing the search, some repeatable way. We'll have the convention that when we close our eyes and forge ahead, we'll always come down the left side. So a depth first search would go from S uh, to A to B to C to D and get stuck. But that's okay because we always combine depth first search with backup. And by that we mean we, we back up to the most recent decision that we made and go forward again. Logical thing to do. So from D we go back to C, no choice is there. From C, we go back to B, no choice is there. From B, we go back to A and see that we've got another choice going to E. And now we go forward again and find a path. So we've only, we've only worked, uh, worked over a small fraction of the, of the total number of paths in the tree. So is this a good idea or not? Well, let's see if we can go back to our map and see what a depth first search does. Not this map, uh, rather the other map. So let's do a depth first search. Well, let's change things around a little bit just so we won't. Let's put the goal in the middle. Now let's put the start in the middle. So we're trying to go from S to G. And we want to know if depth first search is a good idea. So let's try it. Oh, we've already said depth first. Uh, oh, it's, it's working, isn't it? So, did a lot of work on the right side. Because it's, it's blind search. It doesn't know what about directions or anything. So all of those, um, um, all of those connections in green have been uh, thought about by the algorithm. And its final path is a pretty circuitous route. So for this particular problem, uh, you might conclude that depth first search is not too hot. The search you used on the, on the United States map where it's looking at what's going on, that looked like a depth first search. It was a depth first search. Well, let's see. Let's try something else. Let's try a, depth, a breadth first search. So here we're just looking for A solution and E solution. Yep. Breadth first search starts the same place. But now the way it uh, organizes its examination of the tree is layer by layer. So the algorithm first says, ah, I can get to either A or B. Neither one of those are the solution. So it forges ahead another layer. Notices it can get to B or E or A or C. Just reading it off the map again. Still no no solution. C, D can go to C, E can go to G, and now bingo, we found it. Another way of organizing up the search. Breadth first, layer by layer. See how that works. Notice it's kind of going both ways, because it's going layer by layer in the search. So it's wasting. It wasted a lot of time on a, on the wrong side. But this uh, this found the 
shortest path in terms of numbers of streets, numbers of links, as, as they're called. Because right? it, it, it stopped as soon as it hit the goal, so that it, it surely has the fewest number of links in it. That's the path with the fewest number of links. may not be the shortest path, but it's a path with the smallest number of links. Now, both of these searches are completely uninformed about geography. They don't know about direction. They don't know about distance. But sometimes you can do a much better search if you have some outside information about how good a place is to be in. So if you were looking at this map and had a choice between being in uh, E or B, you would say, well, it's much better to be in E even without knowing anything about the, the lengths because you're closer to the goal. So it's heuristic. It's heuristically good to be closer to the goal, even though there might be rivers in the way, and it might turn out not to be such a hot idea after all, but it's a heuristic that it's good to be closer to the goal. So one way you can uh, make use of information like that is you can say, well, let's do hill climbing. It's a sort of an idea grafted on top of depth first search. You start here at S. Uh, you know, from S you can go to uh, either A or B. But now you look at A and B and you say, aha, one of these is going to be closer to the goal. And I'm going to go that way because I like to be close to the goal. Turns out to be a bad idea here, right? <laughs> but nevertheless, it looks, it looks good from the point of view of this algorithm, which is short-sighted. So from S, we decide to go to, uh, to B. From B... We can go to either A or C. Uh, the way I've drawn the map, it's a tie. So we use our left side convention. And we'll go to, uh, to uh, A. Why do well, you see, damn it, you're using your eyes instead of, uh, you're instead of so pretending you're the algorithm. So we're just doing alphabetical order. Right? No, That's no, 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 no. We're using the geographical distance. You see, we're saying, I'm going in the direction that takes me to the place closest to the goal. And B is closer to the goal than A is. So it's a heuristic that it's a good thing to head toward the goal. In this case, it happens to be a bad idea. Let me tell you how hill climbing gets its name. You're wandering around in the White Mountains. A fog sets in. You're trying to get to the top. What do you do? You head uphill. It's usually a good idea. It's usually a good idea. That's why it's heuristic. It's usually a good idea. It's usually a good idea to head toward the goal. In that map over there, you know, you don't want to head off to the right if you're trying to get to the extreme left. That presupposes I have some understanding of well, which in this way things are or something. You, have, you, you know which way things are and you know about maps in general. Okay? So since you know about maps in general, you use this heuristic, sometimes it will screw you. But when it doesn't, it's glorious. And in this particular case, it screws you a little bit. It takes you to B first, then you go to A, then you go uh, to uh, E, and then you go to G. So with hill climbing, you always kind of you always close your eyes. You take one step in each direction. You say, which way is taking me closer to the goal? And you go that way. Now, let's look at what hill climbing will do in this case. All right? This is what happened when we did. Let me just remind you what happened when we did uh, ordinary depth first search. It's just picking one of the possible paths at random each time it has a choice. But now, the path that we choose is not going to be a random choice. It's going to be the place that's closest to the goal. So it knows about... It knows a, about the... A kind of a idea of it, has a, it, it knows about metric distance. It doesn't have to know anything more than distance. It, has to know, it doesn't have to have a view of the map. It just has to have some table that says the distance from this place to that place as the crow flies is. So here's what happens when we do that. So it doesn't monkey around on the right side because those places are far from the goal. And sure, you can find, you can find examples in which this will uh, not work so well. I think the, uh, the, the path that I labeled is um, interesting maybe one such path. Let's remind ourselves what happens here. That's depth first search, also known as the New York cab driver search. And, and notice how it 
over on the right side, it develops a big bulge in the lower right-hand corner. Let's try hill climbing. No big bulge in the right-hand corner. It's, it's sort of attracted to the goal. Now, you'll note that it did, however, make a big detour up in the upper left-hand side. It was uh, strongly attracted to that, uh, to that point because that point is close to the goal. So, for the most part, the heuristic worked well in this search, but not in every case, not in every place. So that's that's hill climbing. So let's see if uh, depth first search plus hill climbing is a way of grafting a, a heuristic on top of hill climbing. Is there a similar thing you can do with breadth first search? And the answer is yeah. There is. What you can do is you can say, my problem with breadth first search is that it tends to be exponential. But what I could do is at every level, I can throw away all but the best looking of the paths so far. Where best looking has the same definition. They're getting you close to the goal. So you're not picking just one path. You're picking some fixed number of paths to carry down. So we might say, well, let's try a breadth first search on this baby here. So we start with S. We can go to either A or B. And now we always have to decide how many paths we're going to keep track of. So this, in this simple case, I'm going to suggest that we just keep track of two paths. So from this situation, we can go to B or E or A or C. And now we got four choices, uh, paths that get us to B or A or C. What did I say? B, E, A, or C. B, E, A, or C. So of those four, of those, of those paths that get us to E, A, B, or C, the two best in terms of this heuristic measure of how far we are from the goal are E and B. So we're just going to stop those other paths. We're not going to use A or C. All right. So now we just carry forward from those two. We get to C and G, and now we found our goal again. So ordinary breadth first search is exponential. This kind of search is linear. Uh, the first kind is exponential in the number of levels. This kind has a fixed width, so it's a constant in terms of number of levels. This one is guaranteed to find a solution. This one is not. So you're paying a little bit of a price. For your speed up. Let's try breath first search on this one. With this one, if we uh, reclaimed those dead paths at the time, say, suppose C terminated, <coughs> and then yep. we, we only have G, then we could reclaim one of them. What I you can do is G. you can use the backup ID again. Yeah. So in any in any search that's not guaranteed to find a solution, you can always back up and try again. Okay, so let's try a beam search on this. Guy. Now let's go back to the uh, one we're with the uh, start in the middle. And now we'll do a, a beam search. And we'll use a beam width of two. That is pretty good. I don't think it's best though. Let's check that out. Oh, I made it. Possibly fatal mistake. I used a search as guaranteed to find the best solution, but it's rather expensive. Hmm. You know why it's expensive? It's not paying any attention to how far it is from the goal. That's the best possible path. You say to me, well, is it, is it always hopeless, uh, hopelessly expensive to find the best path to go? No, there's another way to do it. Works like that. So what you've learned about so far is mechanisms for finding a path to the goal, not an optimal path. Right? That lies ahead of us. And now at this point, we reach a fork in the road because we're going to go in two directions. One way is to say, well, now that we know how to find a path from point A to point B, we can, we can worry about how to find the best possible path from 
A to B from S to G. Or we can say, uh, gee, um, thank you very much. Uh, would also like to learn a little bit about resource allocation. And I think that's the path we're going to go down right now. We'll come back, perhaps, probably, certainly, to optimal search. But I think it would be uh, fun at this point to uh, to look at uh, scheduling for a very important reason. Uh, too often, uh, this stuff is taught this way, and people uh, equate search with maps. And maps are merely a convenient way to introduce the concept of search. They are not search. You get search problems in which there's no map involved at all. How can that be? Well, because maps are really about choices, making, about making a sequence of choices. So you do search whenever you make a sequence of choices, not just when you do a map. That's just one kind of sequence of choices. So suppose, for example, that instead of finding a path through a map, I want to color the United States. Well, that's a sequence of choices, too. That's why it's a search problem as well. So let me explain. I'm going to explain by uh, starting off with a little simpler country, which I call Simplia. And Simplia looks like this. like that. And now um, I'm going to number uh, the states in simply arbitrarily. Uh, I'm going to number them because that's the order in which I'm going to color them. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Now I've decided to color these uh, states in a particularly horrible way. <laughs> I've chosen a particularly horrible order in order to illustrate my point. But in general, you don't know what's the right order, so it's, you know, it's within, the, within the scope of the believable to imagine that I've got a problem and I've accidentally numbered things this way, and this is the, set of, this is the sequence of choices I'm going to make. Now, I know that it's true, finally proved, and that I can do this with four colors. So I've got a bag of colors, red, blue, green, and yellow. And now I'm going to just pick those uh, one after the other so that I don't end up uh, you know, with a disproportionate number of red states. We want it to be fair and diverse and stuff. So let's go. We've got R, red, green, blue, yellow, no problem so far. Red, green, blue, yellow, red. Green, blue, yellow, red, green. Uh, too bad for my side. I can't do number 15. But let's look what I've done so far from the point of view of search. The first thing I had to do was to label state number one. And there are, there are choices. I can use red, blue, green, or yellow. And I'm doing a depth first search in this coloring job because I'm going to take my left branch and just plop down red, which is what I did. Now I've got a label, now I've got to color the second one. And because I'm rotating my color so I don't get stuck statistically with too many red ones, I'll label those uh, blue, green, yellow, and red. And since I'm doing a depth first search, I'll pick an arbitrary one, which is my left side one. And I'll have four more choices. And I'm still rotating my colors around so I don't have statistically too many of one kind. So now I start with, well, I might as well make this consistent with a, with a map up there. So it's blue and yellow. So this is uh, green blue, yellow, and red, and this would be blue, yellow, red, <laughs> green, something like that. 
I may have gotten my colors a little confused, but the idea is I keep rotating them in my choice list so I don't have too many in one color. And now I just keep going with this. And I, and, you know, I've done, uh, th this is uh, state two, this is state three. Uh, I did, uh, uh, this is the, maybe I better line this up a little better. This is the coloring for state one. These are the choices for state two. These are the choices for state three and so on. So one more time, okay. So now we have yellow, red, green, and blue, and we choose yellow. This is for state four, and on we go. And finally, we'll come around to state 15 again. But do you see what's gonna happen if I do a depth first search? Remember the prescription for depth first search. You keep plunging ahead until you get into a, into a dead end where you can't do anything. And I don't notice that I can't do anything until I get down to, to, to 15, which tells me to go back and recolor 14. So I try all the colors for 14 and 15. None of those combinations work either. So I go back to 13. So you see how this, what this tree's gonna look like? I'm gonna develop the whole tree because my problem was in the beginning. Okay. So in the terminology we use, like in the maps, like anything with the colors the same two in a row would be a, a dead end? Well, no, uh, not necessarily two in a row uh, would not cause me a dead end because um, you needn't think that I've chosen to color the uh, states in any way that has to do, in any manner that has to do with their adjacency. For example, in the map of the United States, I could have chosen to color Texas and then Illinois. <clears throat> so you just go all the way to the end and then see if your constraint is satisfied. You go all the way to the point where you've discovered that you've painted two adjacent states the same color. Oh, okay. And then you know you've got to back up. Mm -hmm. Now in that situation where I asserted you've got 10 to the 10th years to do it, how do I know it's going to be real horrible? Well, because of the particular way that I chose to color the states. Let's go back to that other demonstration. I've chose um, Texas circled. And let's slow the speed down. And let's just, oh, that's a check nothing search. It's the mode of check assignment only, start. You see what I've done? I've arranged to do Arizona, then Oklahoma, then Arkansas and Louisiana, choosing a different color for each, and I'm already dead. Those are the first four states I colored, and now I've surrounded Texas with my four colors. There's nothing left for Texas. Mm -hmm. But I've decided I'm going to color Texas last. Mm -hmm. So it's just like this thing with Simplia. Mm -hmm. I've cho chosen a particularly unfortunate order in which to color the, the states on the map. It's old. So what can we possibly do? Depth first search won't work. Maybe some other search would work. Maybe not. There's something much better you can do. And that's what constraint checking is all about. Therese. I just have a question. Because you're calling them depth search. Yeah. level you're, you're picking four. Uh, at each level, at each level I, what I've done is I've shown you all of the choices that I'm picking from. And since this is depth first search, I'm just picking one at random. But what I really mean by at random is I've decided to cycle my colors so that I, you know, just so that I rationally don't get a, get a good mix. And the net result is that I've backed myself into a corner. But when you set the map, you said you picked four states first. So this thing is going to develop a tree, the complete tree of possible colorings for the United States, in which it's guaranteed that every branch will go down. Uh, uh, about more than 40 levels before you discover there's a problem. No, that's not true. There could be some terminated earlier, but um, but the, in the worst case, if this were laid out like Simplia, you'd go down more than 40 levels. When you think about that, a tree of 40 levels, a uh, branching factor of four, so that's four to the, uh, maybe four to the uh, 46th or something. That's uh, two to the uh, 95th or something, two to the 90th or something. 
that's uh, 10 to the 27th or something. And you, you subtract off a factor of 7 because that's how many seconds there are in a year. So you got 10 to the 20th, and you take off another 9, so you do one every nanosecond. And you're still uh, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 11th years, 10 to the 10th years, or something like that. So that's no way to color a map. <coughs> no, that's I, I I've arranged this demonstration by saying this first choice will be for Texas, and this first choice will be for Arizona, the second choice will be for Oklahoma. So I've arranged the choice, the choices to be made in a, in a unfortunate way. All those t states surrounding Texas are are uh, colored first, Texas is away at the end, uh, it's, uh, it's the 50th state, and boom, I really set myself up in a, in a jam. So it's easy to do, right? I don't have to be a genius in order to find a screw case here. This is a screw case. You know, if I did that, if I arranged the states alphabetically, uh, it might or may not, might not be so horrible, and depth first search might or might not find it. I don't know, we can try it. But here at least is one arrangement that's horrible. But you know, uh, this need not have happened. Because uh, really, when you look at this, you say, well, when you look at Simplea over here, you say, well, I can't possibly, oh, that blinking is going to drive us all crazy. We'll get an <coughs> epileptic seizures here before too long. Uh, you know, I, this uh, red, red, green, blue, yellow combination for these uh, first four states can't possibly work because it leaves nothing left for an adjacent state. And so what are we? What, are, what am I really saying? I'm saying that I know something about the relationship between states and their borders. And what I really know is that no state can have the same color as any state bordering on it. And if I keep working the language a little you know, more and more, I, I, what I end up saying is there's a constraint between because when I get around to doing something on 15, there are no colors left. So what this is called constraint checking. Can I just ask a question yeah. back to this pure depth first? Mm -hmm. So does it do all 50 and then see if it constrains? No. It doesn't. Every time it puts a color down, it says, is the color I've just put down consistent with everything I've done so far? Okay. Okay. And we did the same thing here. And the order, the order was such that everything we did so far was okay. But it's that adjacent guy that gave us the problem. Okay, clear on that? Okay. Um, yeah. Why wouldn't you just change the order and say you're going to do the pieces with the highest number of constraints with other, um, with other cells first? Yeah. Um, what Sharon has suggested is that uh, it might make sense to order them in a different way such that the states with the highest number of constraints are colored first. Turns out that's a wonderful heuristic. It turns out that in combination with the technique I'm about to show you, it does very well indeed. So uh, what Sharon has done is invent a layer on top of constraint checking that's almost universally used in solving these kinds of problems. Start with the start by trying to lay down a value for the most constrained thing. Good idea. So here you have the intuition. And it's easy enough to write down the algorithm uh, that goes along with the intuition. Uh, I, I might even attempt it here on my feet. Should I try that? OK. First of all, we need, we need some terminology. There are variables. And what that just means is a is a bag of variable val bag of values that can be attached that a, a bag of values that a variable can take on. So a good example of a domain would be red, blue, green, and yellow. Then there are constraints. Such as uh, not same color. So there is some, some, some terminology and some examples from C 
cij. That's the constraints that link, uh, you know, the variable i to any other variable. Keep x if and only if there exists a y, which is an element of the domain of j, such that cij is OK. Fancy language for something simple, huh? But what, it real, well, but what does it say? It says, I, I'm, a, I'm up here in this place, and I want to know what values are still viable. Uh, there are four possibilities, and I want to know if I can keep them. Well, in order to decide if I'm going to be able to keep a particular value, I have to check all of the constraints that that variable is engaged in. So I have to check it against this one, state 2, state 3, and state 4. So for each of those constraints, I keep x if and only if there's a value at the other end of the constraint such that x is consistent with that value under the constraint. So let's start off here with red, green, blue, and yellow. So I want to know if I can keep red. Well, I want to check it against this constraint. Uh, so I say, um, is that value consistent with this constraint and the, and the collection of values at the other end? In this case, there's only one value at the other end, and it's inconsistent. So I conclude on the basis of what I've seen so far that red is not a possibility. So then I have to say, well, how about green? Is that a possibility? Well, I go over to the world of uh, map coloring. So uh, suppose that we are trying to find, a vet, we're trying to explore uh, this uh, country number 15 here. And we want to know if it's, if if, if uh, country state number 15 is going to object to what we've done. So what we can say is um, for um, x in the domain of i. Uh, for all constraints, the algorithm might say, well, uh, green is in the domain of this variable. So I have to check it against all constraints. Uh, the, only thing I, the only thing I've colored so far is state 1. So I have to check it against the values that I've, uh, the value that I've, I've assigned to state 1. And I want to keep green if red is such that the connection between them allows a red and a green. And it does because they're different. So uh, this is, you know, this is just symbology. The intuition is simple, and not only and that merely reflects it. So where are we so far? Well, um, we are, we're going to do all this coloring with a depth-first search. But each time we try something, we're going to make sure that we do some checking to see if there are any complaints. But I still haven't told you who we're going to check. One possibility is we check everybody and make sure that everything that I haven't already colored can still be colored. Okay? So I can, at one end of the spectrum, I can check nobody. That's what I did at first. At the other end of the spectrum, I can check everybody, no matter how far distant everybody else may be from the states I've colored so far. Let's see how it works. And we better, we better sort of keep, start keeping track because we're wanting one to do some comparisons. So this is going to be uh, check everybody. And I'm going to evaluate these methods on the basis of how many checks they do and how many assignments they do. 
So it's an assignment if I put a color on a state and it's a check if I look at a state and see if there's still some colors that can be put on it given a search, now let me see how many states uh, in the course of uh, all this search I've actually done a check, check on to see if there's a problem. Okay, So that, that's how I'm going to evaluate. So uh, we go back here. We're going, to, we're going to stick with our unfortunate choice of Texas there in the center as the last state to be colored and the four surrounding it is the first four to be uh, colored. And now we're going to go down here to check all values. And when I launch this, uh, what you're going to see in gray is all of the checks that are being made. And you'll see that state after state gets colored. In the meantime, lots of checks are going on. So see one state, all the other states are checked. All the remaining states that haven't been colored are checked. See, we found already there was a problem with Texas. So we backed up, and instead of coloring Louisiana red, we colored it green, just like Oklahoma. So now we're not going to hit that problem at the bottom of our search like we would have if we did no constraint checking. What order is this using now? Just random after the I think it's ra roughly alphabetical, except that I rearranged a few states in order to create oh, the problem. I'll risk all and see if I can speed it up. Now notice that it's, it's really split the country in half. It's got a complete line of colored states right down the middle, but it's still checking on both sides every time it puts a color down. It looks a little wasteful. It doesn't do that. It's still, it's still plotting along uh, coloring the, the states in, the, in order. When it, gets to, when it finally gets to Texas, of course, it'll, it'll know exactly what it has to do. Okay. So it did um, 54 assignments. And checks were 7,324. Now, uh, let us say, well, you know these checks. Uh, we can think of all sorts of ways of, we can think of all sorts of schemes for deciding what to check and what not to check because in the end, the check is only a speed up mechanism. It doesn't either ensure or prevent a solution. We can get a solution with pure depth first search and no checks. It just might take 10 to the 10th years. We can get a solution by checking everything every time uh, and you know we'll get a solution if there is one. But we can also try something intermediate. We can check some states and not check others. And we can try to pick states to check that are very helpful and not check states that are not very helpful. All right? So the next question is, well, if we want to check, do kind of a minimum number of checks and hope that they're real helpful, uh, what the... What would be my what would be my method for deciding what to check? Anybody have a suggestion? Ones that are adjacent. To Ones that are adjacent to what? The state that we're right. about to color. So, uh, Doug mm -hmm. has suggested that we check the states in the immediate vicinity of the last state that had a color assigned. Mm -hmm. Let's try that, Doug. <laughs> I know you get a sinking feeling. Here. No, you shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to check the, the assignment and its neighbors only. Uh, let's, let's slow it down just a little bit so that we can watch it in the beginning. So you can see how that gray is just going out to the neighbors? Sure enough, it did the right thing there in the vicinity of Texas. So now instead of blowing out that gray everywhere, it's just doing it local to the state that's got colored. And now, since it's taken, I think you, now that we've got the idea, we'll speed it up. Now it's got that line down the middle, but notice it only checks on one side or the other because it's only doing local checks. 
So it's never going to check on both sides of that line of colored states down the middle at the same time. Wow, look at that. What an idea, Doug. 78 assignments. And uh, four, only 417 checks. Not bad. Any other suggestions? Well, that's a good idea. Let's try this one. Check the uncolored neighbors. The other yes. side neighbors. Did that one check all neighbors or just the other side? That checked all. That checked all unassigned neighbors. Oh, so okay. Yeah. It, it didn't check the assigned yeah. neighbors. But here's one thing we can do. We can say if the number of possibilities at a neighbor goes down, let's check their neighbors too. Okay. So we'll call that um, neighbors of neighbors. So you got that? Uh, if we get into a situation where the you know you know we start out with four colors possible, maybe you go down to three. Let's check the neighbors of that guy too. So it's going to spread out a little more than uh, than this search, but maybe maybe it'll do a lot of good. I'll slow it down so, so we can see. Check it up to three states distant. Yeah, that's right. So you can see it's blown out a little bit more, but not everything. So it tried red, immediately found it had a problem, went back. So let's try this guy, speed this guy up. As soon as we get that line up the middle of the country, it'll sort of check both sides completely because everything will be pretty close at that point. So are we assuming assignments are more expensive than checks or are they roughly equal? Well, we'll have to think about that. So let's speed this up and get it done. So, 54 assignments and 2,806 <coughs> checks. So we cut down assignments a little bit, but we've got a lot more checks to do. Now there's an intermediate case. We can uh, do that if value is unique. So but here's what I'm here's what I'm saying. Suppose we had a state up here. What we've done the last time, neighbors of neighbors, is each time we've gone through here, we've reduced the number of colorings possible here by one, and we've looked at that as a consequence. Because we're propagating to neighbors of things that have changed. But well, we can have a slightly um, tighter condition, which is that we check this guy only if this guy has been reduced to a unique value. So when this guy gets reduced to a unique value, that puts a lot of constraint on its surrounding, and we might as well go ahead and check them, but we're not going to bother otherwise. Okay, let's speed it up a little bit. Looks like it's doing pretty good. Fifty four assignments, eight hundred ninety four checks. So there, what, what can we extract from this? Well, we can certainly extract from this that some constraint checking is essential because otherwise, because otherwise it takes 10 to the 10th years. We can conclude that 
propagation, full propagation is probably not worth the effort because full propagation relative to propagating through unique values gave you the same number of assignments but a lot more checks. <coughs> about, what about uh, checking neighbors versus uh, moving on from neighbor to neighbors and neighbors? Well, you double the number of checks and you reduce the number of assignments. So there's a kind of trade-off there. What about checking everybody a waste of time? So the net result is that this is what people tend to do. One of those two. For programming simplicity, why not just do that? It's the simplest way that does the job. So that's how you combine search with local constraint checking to get assignments of colors done. Assignments of colors done. And I keep saying that 400 times and then you start slip and you say assignment of resources, assignment of resources to tasks, assignment of colors to states, assignment of resources to tasks. And then, and then after a while you get the idea of what we're trying to do here, see? <laughs> Because you're not interested in coloring maps, but you want to understand how this, uh, this idea works. It's a search. You're seeing what you can do next. If you do a brute force depth first search, it takes forever. If you look around and, and, and look for things that are going to stop you, you can just cut off huge portions of that tree without looking through them. So you can think of it as a tree trimming idea. Generally so vastly useful that you can't do the job without it. It's not just a question of doing it faster, but if you know, if you talk about 10 to the 10th years, you're talking about being able to do it at all, even though it's just a question of speed. As to uh, some upstart new airlines getting started, and they want to know how many airplanes they need. And they say, well, we got a schedule we want, we want to fly, and your job is to figure out the minimum number of airplanes we need to buy, and we'll give you, for every airplane you save, we save, we'll give you half the cost of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an incentive, right? <laughs> So you say, well, let's see. We'll start with the schedule, and uh, we got. <laughs> we got flights, and you got uh, places that they fly to. So, for example, uh, there's a lot of traffic on the uh, on the Boston to. Um, L Is it LaGuardia LGA? LA, no, no, I'm sorry. LX, LGA. So that's one flight we got to do. Then we got another one uh, an hour later, also from Boston to LGA. And we got another one an hour later from Boston to LGA. And in here we've got one from Boston to uh, LAX. And then we've got um, F flight five, flight six, all the way down to what's, what's the convenient number? Ha! Huh, yeah, how about flight fifteen? Just to pick a random number. <laughs> Taking the next one, the flight up. Let's see. First thing we do is we say, well, let's use plane one for that one, plane two for that one, plane three for that one. I suppose we're down here and we fly. Uh, uh, plane four on this one, and then we ask, uh, what are we going to fly on that one? Well, we can't use uh, any of the other any of the airplanes because they're all they're all in flight at the same time that this Boston to LAX flight is supposed to be flying. Um, I'm going to I I should have picked I should have had four flight. Let me just call it flight four, not flight five. That's the order in which I'm going to select airplanes kind of screwed up the ordering of four and five, but that's okay. I think you can make that transition, translation. So if I assign my four airplanes that way, I'm hosed because there's nothing left for the Boston LAX flight. But if I had said, well, uh, I can really fly that airplane back from New York and use plane one here, that means I've got Plane four ready to go there. So you see how the correspondence goes? I've got four colors, I mean airplanes. 
I've got a bunch of states, I mean flights. I'm going to assign planes to flights uh, at all times honoring constraints between the flights. Now, it's not a map, so there's not, you know, the, the constraint is different. In the map, it's the no Jason state shall have the same color. Here, it's um, uh, no uh, two airplane, no airplane will be in, in two places at the same time. So that means that um, there's, a con there's a constraint, for example, between flight one and flight two that says that it's, the airplanes are not the same. And there's one between P2 and P3 that says they're not the same. And P3 and P4, not the same. And all of these, not the same. Oops, not equal, not equal, not equal. Are there any other constraints that I have omitted? Yeah, there's one, this one between P1, uh, between flight four and flight five. Now, not flying at the same time is, is of course, uh, not the right constraint. It's just an illustration. The right constraint is that if you're going to use the same plane for two flights, you better allow enough time for them, you know, for the ends to link up. So if you're going to use the same plane for this flight and this flight, flight four and flight one, there better be enough time to fly back from LaGuardia to Boston, and not just time in the air, but all the turnaround time and all that sort of stuff. So if you're coding this up, that's what you would code up. That, that, that's the constraint, that you have to be able to go from the end of one to the beginning of the other, allowing for flight time turnaround time and all that. But it's still a not equal constraint. It's not same plane, not, it's, not, it's a not same plane constraint. So how would you then do a schedule like this? Well, you do it the same way you do map coloring. You'd try an assignment, then check all the unassigned flights to make sure that there's uh, some airplanes that can fly them. You just keep assigning planes to flights, checking, assigning planes to flights, and so on. Now, there's one other important way that this is different from map coloring. What is it? Is it presumably that your optimum solution may be in a very fiber state plane draw flight, whereas you can't vary the number of states? Yes, approximately. We know that we can color maps with four colors. Uh, some mathematician has told us. But we don't know how many airplanes it's going to take to fly this schedule. So what do we do? Well, nothing, 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 uh, nothing very mathematical, but something kind of heuristic. What, what can we do? Well, brute force. What? Brute force. What, Jeffrey? Well, you can start by assuming a certain number of planes and see if. Yeah. You could, you could over, you could over resource it. Mm -hmm. What's the maximum number of planes I would need to fly 15 flights? 15. <laughs> so I can start with 15. There'd surely be a solution. I can say, well, I've still got some computer time left over, so let me try with 14. And then there's still some time left over, and let me try it with 13. Let's do that with. Let's try that with this. So let's uh, first of all pick a mode. We'll do we'll do the one I said is usually used. Check assignment and neighbors only. But now we're going to over resource it. So instead of four colors, let's use seven. And we'll use a slow speed so we can see what's going on. Now there's no harm in having uh, those four states consume four colors. We've got seven after all. So we can just blow through here, coloring away, doing all of our checking. Boom. And notice we did it with 48 assignments. We never had to. With, we never had to withdraw a color. That's because we over-resourced it. So it was a simple problem because of the over-resourcing. 257 checks did the job for us. Now let's uh, say, well, I don't know anything about maps. Let me try if I let me see if I can color it with six colors. And these are still airplanes and flights, of course. 
No problem. Still did it with 48 assignments. Still an easy problem. 257 checks. I didn't, I'm not keeping track, but I imagine a small number of checks. Is that, or is it, is that right? Same, same number of checks? Same okay. Number of checks. Right. Why, yeah, why should it be different? It's, it's, if it's got 48 assignments, it should have the same number of checks. Uh, that's not, probably not true, but let's try um, five colors. We know it's going to work. See if it does it with 48 assignments again. Not ah, 49. So it had a little more trouble with five colors than it did with six. We know it can do it with uh, four colors, but gosh, we don't have we don't want to buy. I mean, we want a three color printer. Let's see if we can do it with three colors. Hmm. It's having a hard time. Let's speed it up and see if it succeeds. That's working like hell. In fact, when I sped it up completely, it just crashed. You can see that it wouldn't work based on the border. Yeah, because it. I guess it still. I guess it can't do Texas. Can you make it do? Uh, It can't do Texas and it's surround, I guess. Is that right? So it, it it cleared the map because it gave up. That is to say, what it did is it backed all the way up to the top and, and said, I've tried everything. Uh, we've um, now combined search with uh, constraint checking. And this is the important half of the morning, I think. There's another piece that we'll do. Uh, we'll do optimal search. But it's, um, it's a different subject, and it's not as important, I think. I think it's, I think it's just cool stuff, important stuff, and uh, commercially useful stuff, and, and all that kind of stuff. But we'll do optimal search next. I guess there's one flourish I'll put onto this. Uh, frequently, your problem is over-constrained, and there's no solution with the available resources. So what you have to do in those circumstances, you have to turn constraints into preferences. And you say, well, I want to allow some states to be adjacent to states of the same color, but I'm going to take that as a bad thing. Or you're going to allow some deadhead flights, but you're going to try to avoid them. So that's a way of turning a constraint into a preference. And now you can start combining all this stuff and layering on top some other kind of, yet, yet another kind of thing like beam search or something that tries to, tries to minimize the penalties that you've accumulated in it and maximize the number of constraints that are satisfied. But that's a gory detail, and I think having said it, that's enough. How can we do, how can we do uh, optimal search? Well, we have to draw a big line through uh, what you've done so far, because we're really going to go uh, all the way back uh, now and, and forget <coughs> a, completely about constraint checking and think instead in terms of um, finding optimal paths, shortest paths. But there's one parallel, and that is that we'll start with a, we'll start that a method that's sure to work, but awfully expensive, and then we'll use a heuristic to reduce the amount of work we've got to do at the same time still assuring success. Well, let's see, how can we, how can we do this? Uh, let me uh, erase those distance lines because I don't want them to be confused with, with roads. Uh, suppose uh, that your assignment is to find the best possible path through that map in terms of distance. And you're going to use the heuristic of uh, one of the most powerful heuristics in problem solving. That is to say, you're going to ask somebody who knows the answer. You're going to ask a, an oracle or a friend or something like that what the right answer is. And the oracle says, oh, uh, the right answer for this map is SAEG.
What's the distance on that? Four, four, and five. I guess that's 11. Path length is 11. <clears throat> but now, uh, you're all students at the same university, and although you've uh, drunk beer with uh, this friend, uh, you, you can't be sure that he isn't trying to screw you. I'd give you the wrong answer. Maybe he wants to go to medical school, too, or something like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, there's an example. <laughs> Deliber <laughs> deliberately screwed you. It's 13? Four, four, eight. Yeah, 13. So uh, you hope that your friend's <coughs> advice will save you a lot of work, but you're not. But you're going to check it. You don't trust them. So how can you check it? Well, you can just make sure that every other path is at least that long. So let us decorate what I've done so far uh, with a fuller expansion. Let me just get this out a little bit, make this a little bit wider, more space so that we can see what's going on. You now check all other paths to make sure that their length is at least 13, and then you'll believe the friend. So let's do that. So from S, we can go to A, or we can go to B. And if we go to B, the accumulated path length is 5. From B, you can go to either A or C. And if you go uh, to A, the accumulated path length is uh, 8. If you go to C, it's also 8. From A, at this point, you can go to E. And from C, at this point, you can go to D. And that extra length from um, A to E adds 5. So that's 13, right? And this uh, A to D, that's 13 as well. So if I've done an addition right there, I don't trust myself anymore. Which one's which one's twelve? Are they both twelve? What? Now I don't trust you. Thirteen. So it's uh, five plus three is eight plus three is eight. So um, C to D uh, is uh, eight plus four is twelve, and uh, A A to E is uh, also twelve. So um, it looks like we uh, still have to keep going because these are these these are both twelve, right? Now, yeah. so um, at this point we can extend this path to all the way to the goal, and now we've got um, twelve plus five is um, seventeen, and this is at this point a dead end. So now you've done enough work to check. Have you done enough work to check? Not quite, because there might be other paths that go through A. So let's check that, too. From A, you can go to either B or E. And you go on E to E here. So if you go from A to B, uh, you have 4 plus 3 is 7. And then if you carry on from B to C, you um, add 3, so that's 10. And from C to D, you add 4, so that's 14. And now this path is already longer than the one the oracle told you about, so you don't have to go on from D. You wouldn't have to anyway because it's a dead end. So let's try this one, S-A-E. <coughs> now from... Oh, I guess that's the only way we can go. So I think I have I developed have I done developed the whole tree. Right, so I haven't saved too much, maybe a little bit. But the basic idea is that we've um, tried to um, make use of something somebody told us. But usually there's no friend around. It's the way life is, I guess. So we have to be our own. <laughs> we have to be our own friend, in some sense. So we have to think about how we can make something like this work without um, without any uh, oracle telling us the, about the uh, about the best path. Then we think of what to do. Just keep track of as we reach node what the best path like to that node is, and if we get to that node, find a different path to forget about. Well, let's see. Um, that sounded 
like I had the right words. I don't know if they're in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing we could do, maybe it's uh, consistent with what you said, is we could find the, we could find any some old path to the goal by some other search technique, and then uh, use that as a reference uh, for during our checking. So we might find a path to the goal with depth first search or breath first search. And then once we've got that, that path length, then we can start checking against it until every other path is longer than that. Of course, we might not be lucky. We might not have the best path to the goal from our first search. So we may change our mind about what the best path is as we keep trying to verify that the best one we've got so far is, in fact, the best one by extending everything else to be longer than that. So it um, seems like what whatever we're doing, we, we're... You know, the, the the intuition we're kind of working with is we always got to put, keep pushing paths that don't reach the goal out until their length is further than a path that does reach the goal. Now let's say that 150 times, and you you keep expanding the shortest path you've got until it's you keep it short, expanding the shortest path you've got until you find the goal. You keep extending the shortest path you've got until it's longer than the goal. What you can do is you can say, hell with the oracle, I'm going to have to do all this work of extending every path to be as long as the path to the goal anyway, so I might as well just keep working on the shortest path I've got so far. And eventually one of those will get to the goal, and then I'm almost done because all the other paths are about that length too, and I just have to make sure I get, keep pushing those beyond the goal length. Okay? So that is called branch and bound. That's a branch and bound idea. So you just you start with the, the sh you know you, st you start the search you got you know, all the paths that lead from the starting position you say one of those is the shortest let me carry on with that as soon as I carry that forward a little bit those paths probably won't be the shortest anymore you'll go find the ones that are you keep pushing those forward eventually one of those will be will hit the goal then you'll use that as a reference point try to make everybody longer than that. Sometimes you'll change your mind because the first path you encounter the goal may not be the best one. But as soon as all of the paths are longer than uh, a path you've got in your hand to the goal, then you're done. You've got the optimal path. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Let's see if we can make it work. For this, we uh, go back uh, to Cambridge. We've got our start in the middle. We've got our goal on the left side. Let me just uh, change that around just for a second. So put the goal in the middle. Starts on the left side. And we're going to do a branch and bound search. So what's it doing? It's picking the shortest path it's got and trying to push it forward. And eventually it'll find a path to the goal. It's found several paths to the goal. And it keeps the shortest one as the reference and makes sure that all the other paths are longer than that. Okay, so notice it didn't bother doing anything further to the right because all of the paths that would get it further to the right would be longer than the path to the goal. Everybody happy? Now let's suppose that we uh, accidentally, stupidly, decides to do the search in the other direction. So we'll put the start in the middle. What do you think is going to happen? Search to, right. search to the right as well as to the left because it's just checking path length accumulate. It has no idea what's, which paths are getting it closer or further from the goal. So sure enough, it's doing a lot more work because it's uh, wandering off to the right. <coughs> We know what the right answer is because we found it going the other way. This one's going to take a lot longer because it's uh, there are a lot more paths uh, from that particular position that have um, suspiciously suspicious lengths. Eventually, it finds it, but notice that all the stuff on the right screen too. 
Okay, now uh, we draw a little line through our notes. Not, not through our notes, under our notes. <laughs> because we're going to be able to speed this one up. Because we know something about maps, so we're going to use a heuristic. It's not guaranteed to be helpful. The whole, the whole search is guaranteed to produce the optimum still, but this uh, helpful heuristic may not help. Well, what's the helpful heuristic? It's about maps, and we know something about maps. We know that if we're at this place, and we want to get to this place, the shortest possible distance is the straight line distance as a crow flies. So if we want to know something about how good a path is that goes through B, that goes from S to B, we know that any path that goes from S to B will have to have a path length that's equal to or longer than the distance from S to B plus the airline, crow flies distance from B to goal. Because no way of getting from B to the goal can be shorter than that airline distance. So now what are we trying to do? We've got a path that goes from the start to the finish, start to the goal. We're trying to push the shorter paths out to they're at least that long. But now we can add the accumulated distance to the airline distance and say if the sum of those two is greater than the known distance to the goal, we can kill that one too. So this is just a way of killing off paths earlier in the process because we're going to know that they're, they, can't, they, they can't possibly be the, the best path to the goal because the distance you've gone so far plus the airline distance is already already rules them out. Okay? So this isn't, though, going to take into account the direction. Like in the, the first time we used map information. Using distance. We used distance. distance. We were able to yeah. you know, only search one side of the map. Yeah, the other that's other right. Side was off. This is not yeah. going to limit it in that way. Yeah. Way. In both cases, it's a question of speed up. In the first case, in the first set of searches, we're not guaranteed to find an optimal path. But using the heuristic usually, usually speeds us up. In this case, we're going to find an optimal path either way, and the heuristic usually speeds us up. And in, but, in the, but in this case, to do not confuse that general heuristic principle with the, with, the, with the fundamental intuition here. You're, going, you're basically trying to push all of the paths that are possible out to the point where they're worse than the path that you think is best. So here's how this would go. We're going to start in the middle. But now we're adding the airline distance in. Okay? So none of that stuff on the right-hand side gets explored because as soon as you get to the right, you're increasing your airline distance and terribly penalizing those paths. So there's only one step left. That's, that's a great idea. Uh, that's the branch and bound idea with the addition of this so-called admissible heuristic, this, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, underestimate of remaining distance. If you've got an underestimate of remaining distance, you can save a lot. But there's one more thing you can do with these searches, for these optimal searches. Or actually, not merely with the optimal searches, with any of the searches. And we've, we just kind of, we've kind of, we've kind of overlooked it. This would work, yeah, sure. You'd go, you'd, you'd have to go right. It doesn't say you. It doesn't say your. It doesn't say your estimate is always going down. But it, but but it says if you're comparing two paths, you, you can use this 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 to so, guide you. So once once you've found a path to the goal, then that, it starts comparing. Is that? No, it's always it's always It's a, you're always extending the shortest path in the expectation that eventually that shortest path will take you to the goal, and that's what you want. And you haven't wasted any effort because you've got you to push all the other paths to a point where they're longer than that anyway in order to know you're, you've succeeded. So once you've made a few bad detours along what you thought was the path along the left, then our shortest distance would be long enough that we would yeah. start checking to the right. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure... What um, what examples are you thinking of that that well, uh, might be causing example, you pause? The only path to G 
yeah. was from that the lower right corner. Yeah. There was a route going to G, but the, the paths that currently go to G were truncated. So that G is on the left side, but you have to go all the way to the right before getting. Okay. So. You're, you're you're imagining there's a there's a river flowing here. Sure. And uh, maybe it goes around this way, so that the shortest path actually takes you around that way. That's okay. You're, you know, you're, you, you, you're, you're, you're going to be blowing paths out here, and um, you're, you're going to be working on the path that has the minimum accumulated <coughs> distance plus remaining distance. And because of that, you might be sucked into a, a corner here. These, these are only heuristics, after all. Because this guy, the accumulated distance here plus the airline distance is short. Uh, but then, uh, as you start exploring beyond here, uh, what you discover is that these paths are getting worse because they, there, there is no way of crossing the river. So yeah, you'll you'll be you'll be drawn to this place temporarily, but if there's really a river in there and you can't get there without working your way around it, then eventually this path this path accumulated distance plus airline distance to the goal will turns will turn bad, and uh, you'll still get the right answer. One more thing. I know everybody's hanging on by their, their fingernails are turning bloody and <laughs> you're, you're, if you never see search again in your life, it'll be too soon. But there's one. There's just one more thing. You have to look at this and you have to say, wait, whoa, wait a second here. Um, you, you look at this and you say, there's something peculiar here because uh, there's more than one way to get to A. And it would be screwing in the extreme if you could get to A with four units of work and decided to go to A with eight units of work. So whenever whenever there is more than one way to get to a place, you always trim off the, the long way. That's what I was saying earlier. Ah, is that it? That's, that's yeah. <laughs> so you get rid of that. And similarly, there are two ways to get to B. So you get rid of that. That's called dynamic programming principle. It's a, it's a variation on the theme of the dynamic programming principle. So you want to do an optimal search. So you take branch and bound. You add shortest distance if you've got one. And then you add the dynamic programming principle to trim off stuff, trim off uh, multiple ways to get to the same place, trim off the, the, the worst way, the worst way, the worst are, the inferior ways. And that gives you something that an in artificial intelligence, for reasons lost in history, is called A star search. And now we've uh, we, we, we've reached the end because understanding A star search is the is the end point of understanding optimal search. So what do you do? I'll think about the Oracle a little bit and then you say, well, what, what I'm, the intuition is I'm going to push everybody out until everybody's worse than the thing that I've identified as the trial best path. Sometimes my idea will change as I push stuff out, but eventually everything will be worse than the than the than my trial path, and I'll know I'm done. That's the first intuition. Second intuition is that I don't have to tolerate. I don't have to work just with the accumulated distance. I can also use some underestimate of the remaining distance to help me to do my trimming. Third idea. If there's a way to get to the same place, if there's more than one way to get to the same place, get rid of the inferior ways. And when you combine all three of those, you've got A star search, and it's guaranteed to find the best possible path, and generally it's pretty fast. If you just have branch and bound, it can be pretty slow. But it still finds the optimal path. So that, uh, that completes the morning. Uh, we've done three things. We've uh, started off finding paths through graphs, or, or rather, more precisely said, we found ways of, of um, organizing um, um, sequences of, of choices, sequences of decisions about where to go. And sometimes those are connected to a map, but they don't have to be. They can, you know, the choice about where to go can be what to color next. 
And so we talk about depth first, breadth first, beam, hill climbing, all those are variations on the on elementary search. Then we split and went two ways. One way was to combine uh, search with constraint propagation as in map coloring or in scheduling. And we find that we can take a search that would take unthinkable eons and make it practicable by trimming off vast portions of the search tree with constraint checking. Then we came back and said, well, let's think about maps again, think about optimal search. Doesn't have to be maps, but it's easy to explain with maps. And there we see that there are some ways of finding the best possible path uh, by using this branch and bound idea and combining it with dynamic programming or shortest distance or both. Okay, so that, uh, that's it for the morning.